Hi everyone, welcome to um, another webinar from the Northwest Local Land Services. My name is Kate McCarthy. Um, I'm a livestock officer uh, with Northwest Local Land Services, and you'll have to bear with my voice a little bit for the first initial part. Um, it's just a little bit croaky. Um, but yeah, we're really excited to have um, Dr. Mark Ferguson along to present genetics information to us. Um, and essentially, yeah, how can genetics influence the, the future productivity um, of the sheep industry? So um, at Local Land Services, if my PowerPoint will work, um, at Local Land Services, essentially, yeah, what we're aiming to do is provide information to, to you guys listening in um, and help support, you know, to support to improve agricultural productivity um, and better manage our natural resources. So at Local Land Services, we've got units that cover a, a, a wide variety of, um, of different, you know, uh, areas of agriculture from veterinary services to ag services to biosecurity services and um, natural resource management. So we cover a vast range of things and, um, yeah, we look forward to bringing you um, things like this. So, um, uh, I'd just also like to acknowledge the traditional um, custodians of the land the, um, or that we are on today. And um, just for some things for the webinar, um, I'm going to have some poll questions in, in a moment um, for you to answer just quickly. And as you are probably all very familiar, this webinar um, is, you're automatically muted. So please feel free though to ask questions. The question tab sits on the panel that you've got um, on the right hand, hopefully on your screen. If you just type your questions, I can see them in front of me and I'll ask them to Mark at the end of his presentation. Um, it'll be a survey and we all love filling out surveys at the end of the webinar. Um, and I would really appreciate if you could just take a short amount of time to do that because it helps us know what we what you want to know about essentially so that we can deliver relevant things um, that are going to be helpful. So um, and as usual the recording is going to be available to um, to everyone who's registered. So yeah. um, I'll just do before I do an intro to Mark, I might just do the polls. So if everyone wants to just tell us where what is your focus of your sheep enterprise at the moment. I'll just give you a couple of seconds to fill that in. It's just quite a general sort of focus, but it will help Mark um, tailor some of his genetics information. See a fair portion of dual purpose. Um, and that's about everyone. So I'll close that and share. So as you can see, um, yeah, 71% of the dual purpose, which is probably to be expected, and then um, half half between meat. Um, and wool production. So the next poll is going to be, um, where are you located? Just out of interest, and if we have um, any anyone from New Zealand listening in, then um, they didn't put outside of Australia, but obviously outside of New Zealand, um, or you know, outside of New South Wales, sorry, not New Zealand. <laughs> um, so yeah. And just a few more seconds for that one. And I think that's about everyone. That was quick. So yeah, a bit of a a bit of a um a spread on people listening in. So um last poll, if I can work this out properly, which is most importantly. Just a bit of an understanding of where you are in the space of genetics and um, helps us direct the presentation. What What is your level of knowledge of ASBVs and um, indexes? And one is the lowest, five is the highest. So that's almost everyone. And I'll close that now. And share that. So hopefully you can see. 
Um, so it's a bit of a spread, like a bit of a spread of knowledge um, here today. So that's good. And most people are genuinely aware of what um, ASBVs and genetics mean in the sheep industry. So hopefully we'll be able to develop on that with this um, presentation. Um, so now I'll just work out how to close it. And I'll introduce Mark. So I'm really excited to hear from Mark. Um, I I found Mark via um, listening to his podcast, uh, the Head Shepherd podcast, which is really interesting. And he, he talks to a lot of um, quite, you know, innovative and, and rel producers that are doing really relevant and um, thinking outside the square. So I found Mark that way and, and thought it'd be good for him um, to, to come and talk about genetics because that's one of the themes that he discusses a lot. Um, and Mark um, essentially is, if I just get this up, sorry, my notes have disappeared. Um, yeah, so Mark um, grew up in the Victoria part of, um, sorry, in the family farm in the Victoria Mallee, now I've got my notes together, <laughs> and has spent his career in the sheep industry working throughout Australia and New Zealand. Um, Mark completed a PhD in Merino genetics in Western Australia before he moved to New Zealand to establish a portfolio of genetic research and development on behalf of the New Zealand Merino Company. In 2017, um, in partnership with his wife, Nisha, he founded NextGen Agri Limited. Mark now works with um, progressive stud and commercial producers across Australia and New Zealand, um, helping them breed the best sheep and cattle for their situation. NextGen Agri also undertakes research and development projects on behalf of a range of industry organisations. Mark is passionate about the role of technology, of the, about the role technology can play in enabling sheep and cattle producers to make timely and well-informed decisions. He lives in Christchurch with his wife and three children, and um, yeah, very happy that he could be here today to, to provide um, us with a bit of information. So I'll hand over to you now, Mark. Um, and I'll just open this, allow you to actually present. Hopefully you got that. Yeah, all good. Just press the right buttons. How are we looking? Um, yep, I can see, perfect. I can see your presentation. Awesome. Thanks very much, Kate, and welcome all, and thanks for, thanks for having me along. Um, Nice to be there virtually and hopefully in another few weeks I'll get there in reality, which is pretty exciting after being out of the country for 14 months, locked away with COVID. But um, yeah, I really appreciate the opportunity and I'll just get into the presentation. We've only got, got an hour together, but uh, yeah, hopefully you can write those questions down so Kate can feed them through. Um, thanks for filling out the poll to start with. So we've got sort of 85% of people with some wool focus um, quite a few people outside of outside New South Wales, and we've got yeah, a good spread of knowledge of ASBV. So we'll go across um, a variety of levels, I suppose. But um, yeah, but hopefully we can keep it at a level that that meets all all needs. Um, Thirty times is a number I use a fair bit at the moment, and that's um, and normally I'll be getting some audience participation, but we can't do that, so I'll get straight to the point. But 30 times is roughly the number of times uh, you as a, a manager of a sheep enterprise or involved in a sheep enterprise get to make a genetic decision. Um, roughly sort of before that, someone else is making those decisions and after that time, someone's coming up under you and making those decisions again. Um, obviously that number differs a fair bit, but the point is it's not that many. If we think about the number of times we get to work out how much we're gonna feed our sheep or, or um, a whole heap of other things, um, on a, in our farming calendar, um, our genetic decisions are actually made very few times in our career. So I guess the point that I like to make there is it's really important that you get them right um, and put some time into it. I guess we see a lot of people that kind of rock up to a ram sale and um, haven't done a lot of planning or get a might even just get an agent to buy those rams. Um, I guess, yeah, the opportunity cost of getting the wrong decision is in my head a, a fairly important one and that's kind of what Next Gen Agri do is help people make those decisions. Um, I'm just gonna get this box out of the road. Uh, so um, 
and I guess the reason the reason for that is is the opportunity of of not not making that good gain is if we've got this great opportunity in, in any livestock enterprise for making genetic gain, and the more accurate that that your selection process is, particularly at the ram end, a lot of you um, there's a few that are gurus of ASBVs, and you might be seed stock producers, but there's a lot of you online that um, have said um, said you're less informed about that, and so might be just a lot of people just buying rams. Um, and that's that's the opportunity to make genetic gain really um, with a bit of selection. But any error you make in in your selection process slows down your rate of genetic gain, and that's just a lamb weaning weight example. It's it's obviously theoretical. You don't make those sort of massive gains, but that's what is possible. And the important thing there is it's compounding. It's like compounding interest. If you make gain on on a trait, you've got that you sort of you've got you're already at a better place the next year, and so it goes. Um, it can, keeps compounding, so there's a massive opportunity in genetic gain, and and over a 30-year period, you can really change the the complete um, the sheep type you're farming with by making good genetic gain and good genetic decision. So, um, the sheep industry, we don't really have a good estimate, obviously, of what the rate of gain is, but it's well less than one percent. Um, dairy industries are up sort of closer to three or four percent. Um, we in the sheep industry and in the beef industry uh, have an enormous opportunity that sits on the table every every year that we, a lot of us leave sitting there on the table and don't take the opportunity. A lot of us sit at maybe half or one, but not even 1% uh, in terms of genetic gain. I guess I've just covered this in terms of comp compounding, but if you think about um, the timing and, the, and where you are in your farming career, you might be starting out or you might be heading towards the twilight years. But um, if you are starting out, the opportunity is really to get into it because the gap keeps widening. If you, if you don't start making gain, start making good decisions early, the gap just keeps getting wider in terms of the opportunity that you've, and you'll never catch up um, on, on a genetic gain front. So the quicker you go, uh, other than obviously selling out your livestock and starting again, but um, the later you start, the smaller the impact. So really, get into it is is the point here, and we'll get into some real stuff soon. But just just getting getting the base set. But I guess the other thing that I often hear about is um, well, one thing you hear is that 90% of the breeding goes down their throat, which is kind of true. There's a lot of management is a big impact on your on your farming enterprise, management and feeding, um, and that. I don't think this it's one or the other. Obviously, getting your nutrition right through a range of processes is important, um, but you may as well have a good good basis of, of livestock to feed because the combination is is where the real the real gold lies. The one thing I do hear a lot is um, is we just sort of use hybrid vigor or we use crossbreeding to kind of that's the way we make genetic gain, um, and and that's that is a, a legitimate strategy to have to use some crossbreeding to to get a bit of a lift um, because it is a real thing. A heterosis or hybrid vigor um, does give you a lift, particularly in reproduction traits and a little bit of growth traits. Um, so you do get a lift from, and that's where you use obviously unrelated breeds um, and you get you get the average of the progeny being better than the halfway between the parents. Um, but best case scenario, and most traits you don't get, you get sort of five to 10% hybrid vigor as a maximum. So best case scenario is seven years of genetic gain will wipe out any hybrid vigor. So um, if you're just thinking, oh, I'll just use a crossbreeding strategy and and that will be that'll sort out my genetics. If if the basis of your two crosses that you're using isn't changing, then you'll get a bit of a lift, but that lift will be to just sit there and be the same lift every year for the 30 years versus genetic gain, which is after about seven years, you're in front of that hybrid vigor, and then every year after that, you're getting ahead of what you would have done if, with just that straight crossbreeding strategy. So, best of both worlds is to use both of those things, make genetic gain with both um, both components, and then and that might be a, so a terminal over your. Um, we've got quite a few meat and wool focused people, so a terminal over your 30 or 40 percent of use that are the beef mob use um, gets gets the both the best of both worlds if you're buying good terminal rams, and you're buying good merino rams to breed those maternal ewes. So we can't really get feedback here, and um, but just in terms of uh, something to think about is, are you making genetic gain? Are you, and I guess, and a subsequent question to that um, 
is not there um is is how do you know um and so just it is really important to sit back and think well what am i doing every year that would mean that my next generation of animals is is better than my previous so my 2021 drop of lambs are going to be my best ever or going to be better than my 2020 uh, 2020 drop of lambs which were better than my 2019 how do you what are you doing to to achieve that and it can be things like obviously buying better rams year on year it can be doing some new selection strategies um, and there's a range of things you can do to make genetic gain but important to think about in your business are you really maximizing the opportunity that sits there are you are you even close to that two and a half percent of a potential genetic gain so we're going to quickly um go through the four pillars of genetic gain so what it is that sort of the bits the levers you can pull to to make a change in your enterprise and, and as part of this we'll cover aspvs and go through them um and the sort of four key ways that that change or that you have some potential to change to to increase the rate of genetic gain within your sheep flock and we've got a frozen up we're away um so the four things or the four things that i'm going to talk about that do control your rate of gain is is firstly is the heritability of the trait you can't change that um, but it is important to at least understand that if you're um, if you're selecting for a trait that's really lowly heritable, that means you have to get really focused on it. If a trait that's really important to you is really highly heritable, um, you'll sort of almost get it for free. So, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, accuracy of selection is where your real opportunity lies. Making sure when you're making decisions about which which animals get to stay on your farm and which animals you bring into your farm. Um, how, the more accurate that decision is, the better you'll go. Selection intensity we'll cover, which is um, you don't have a lot of control of, but we'll, we'll cover a little bit about how you can tweak that. And then generation interval is another way that, that speeds up genetic gain, obviously, and we'll cover that briefly as well. The big one that you get to control is, is the accuracy of selection. So heritability, it's um, obviously a most people understand what heritability means but it's the proportion of the variation between individuals that can be explained by genes so everything we see on an animal and can measure on an animal is a um, which i'll cover in a bit is, is a combination of genes and and other factors um, and the heritability is how much of that is for that particular trait is 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 controlled by by genetics and i guess some of the things that we would typically look at um, we've got quite a few merino people online um, where fiber diamond is one that you know was really heritable back in micron madness days we knew that we could shift micron really quickly um, and literally you can do it with your eyes closed uh, by by the handle of the wall it's really highly heritable um, you can yeah it's a really easy trait to, to shift and if all we had to do was focus on micron we could do that without any breeding rays or any real fancy measurement and we've seen that we've we've achieved that um, for all of our businesses growth is a really good is a is generally fairly important whether you're meat or or wool um it's 40 percent heritable so again a good trait in terms of uh, you can if you measure it and you can you can get good gain good rates of gain with that highly heritable trait probably something that most of us like to uh think we're improving is is reproduction um, and that's often important for many businesses and i guess this year in australia with new prices like they are and have been um, and a rebuild going on reproduction is absolutely paramount um, and unfortunately it's the lowest heritable trait between all the reproductive traits are, are very lowly heritable um, but there is massive variation so don't throw in the towel we can make gain but I guess it's just important to know where it's just important to understand the traits that you're playing with as to how how heritable they are um, a lot of the traits that resistance type traits sit around 20 percent resistance to worms at 20 percent resistance to foot rot about 20 percent um to a couple of traits that i'm really passionate around uh, fat and muscle and and they sit sort of 20 to 30 percent so that that all means that we can make gain for the traits that are important to you we just and, and i guess when we get to it um you kind of don't need to know that much about heritability because the breeding values take it into account but it is it is just important to know if you're 
if you're putting half your selection pressure on fibre diamond and half your selection pressure on reproduction, you'll end up with 90% shift in, in fibre diameter and a little bit of shift in reproduction just because of those different heritabilities that you're playing with. Um, so the, yeah, the thing that I guess that's most important for for most uh, ram buyers or ram breeders is this accuracy of selection, making sure that the individuals you're choosing to keep or to um, to breed from or to buy in um, are chosen on the best information possible. And that's really that's our gig as as sheep breeders. Is that's what we get to change and that's what we get to to do as much as um, and and have the biggest impact. The thing I always like to say is that error is the enemy of genetic gain. Every little thing that we do that drops our accuracy of selection, whether that's sort of quickly drafting up some news or um, or buying a ram without any information, every every bit of error we bring into that um, is is just reducing our genetic gain. So we have to really think about how much blur is in this decision, how much white noise is in this decision I'm making, and how much is actually on on genes. Um, and again, I'd normally be asking this question, but but the sources of error that you get to that will impact on your business will be ramp selection. So how well you do that job, whether you go driving up the driveway of someone with really highly accurate breeding values, or I guess the other end of that spectrum, you've got someone else who just grabs them for you and sends them your way, um, and that's the sort of full the full range of ramp selection policies we see. Um, your replacements, um, obviously most of your genetic gain is coming from your rams if you're a commercial, uh, just a ram buying farmer, uh, but if you're breeding rams then the ewes are, I'd argue, even more important than, than the rams, but but very important anyway. But the, the, your ewe replacement strategy, what's going on in, in uh, some error there, and and how you're treating your adult ewes, which which ewes are getting removed from your flock, What's what are the decisions being made there. So there's, in each of those things, and all of you will be Doing each of those things, you'll be either you'll be buying rams, or you might be breeding them and selecting which ones you keep. You'll be deciding which ewes go out the door as either weaners or as as hoggets. To do somewhere in there, you'll be getting rid of some ewes, and you're making some decisions, or someone's helping you make that decision. And then you'll be getting rid of some ewes off your farm that are they're going out the back door. And again, you'll be making some decisions, and every one of those decisions has some error associated with it. So this is sort of genetics 101, and and we all know this, but the phenotype um, is what we see and what we can measure. It's obviously made up by genetics, um, by the DNA and the environment. I think we need to really understand that that's for every single trait. Often I see, particularly in maybe in the wool game a bit more than meat, but we often see um, people assume that, um, people know that, that the say growth is partly genetic and partly environment. We see some bigger ones because they've been on better feed or bigger ones that were singles. Um, but then when it comes to something like wool quality, we think that's 100% genetic and that must be all just a good set of genes that have produced that great wool, which is not true. It's equally under control of genes and environment. Um, and we'll, we'll cover that as, as we go through, but we need to think, and this is true for structural traits, true for everything. Nothing is 100% under genetic control. Um, and and so therefore it's all open for manipulation or all open to some error creeping in. And I guess the entire process, our entire job as as ram breeders and and those that help ram breeders is um, is to find the wheat and the chaff, which is the genes. We're trying to make decisions about which genes are um, are the right ones to, or which animal has the right set of genes. And all of the tools we can use to help us do that is is the thing we need to do and try to remove those environmental influences and other influences as much as we can. Um, and when we walk into a, a group of ewes or a ram sale shed, most of what we see is not due to genes. And we saw that from those heritabilities, mostly the genetic influence is less than, less than 50%, um, often around, around 30%. And so, Lots of things that are uh, that we see in an animal is is due to either is the climate, whether it's born a, a single twin or triplet, um, the age of its of its dam. So if it's out of a if you're joining ewe lambs um, or if you're joining or even two earth ewes, that will have an impact on how that animal looks, particularly de depending on when you're looking at it. Um, 
obviously location, some areas uh, are drier, some are wetter, some, there's a whole heap of reasons why why an animal might look the way it does because of the environment that's been, that's just sort of standard within that, within that location. Um, within the merino industry we have, and I guess in the, in the terminal ram buying as well, not, um, we have some different places will feed their rams differently and some will house them, which completely blurs the, the lines a lot. You can't actually see what, um, that takes the environment out and feeds the hell out of them. So it makes it really difficult. Obviously the age of those animals, um, some in a lot of ram breeding flocks, you'll have autumn and spring drops, you'll have um, early born, late born, there's a whole heap of things that, that again, you're trying to, you're, when you're there on sale day or, or you're looking at your own news, you're trying to work out, is that just a late born twin or is it an early born single and therefore it looks different? Um, and then nutrition has a big influence. So really when we're looking at a, a set of rams or a set of ewes, um, there's a whole heap of stuff that that is just there to confuse the hell out of us, and and we're sort of grappling to try and remove remove the error. Um, and I guess that's where breeding values become really important. And I I tell the story a bit, but I started my PhD kind of wanting to prove that breeding values don't work. Um, me and my brother bred poultry at sheep, and sort of breeding values weren't weren't new then, but probably new to me. Um, and and by the end of yeah, by the end of sort of really, well, then it was sort of five or six years of looking at it, and now, um, so sort of twenty years on, um, just yeah, absolutely in awe of the power of of what breeding values can achieve. They're a dangerous tool if you use them poorly, but an amazingly amazingly accurate tool at, at getting at at starting to understand what's underpinning the the sort of performance you want to get and and how you put those traits together. It's it's um, a really amazing tool, and they're an amazing tool because they're trying to separate out all of that blur and give you a number that's um, that's actually useful and you can actually use and rely on that number to make a, a selection decision. So obviously this is in your RAM buying um, strategy. Um, you won't have these unless you're a stud on, on your use, but um, but the beauty of a, an ASPV or a breeding value is what goes in there is the measurement of the trait. So every individual animal often, depending yeah, on a, we'll just go for a gold standard sort of, if you're going to the right ram breeder that's doing everything, um, measure the trait uh, nutrition. So that's taken into account by by making sure that those animals have been run together, and so nutrition is has been normalised. Um, genetic linkage is used to to um, normalise nutrition across different uh, locations. The management of those animals, same same thing, um, by having them in a in a common group, all of those management factors can be can be removed. Um, the age of the animal is is taken into account. Single twin or triplet, massively important. Um, you wouldn't believe how important that is to what you see and what you measure on an animal. We know that twins grow a bit slower, but there's a whole heap of other things that are going on, particularly in, in the merino people online. Um, twin born animals don't look as shiny as single born animals, and, and a lot of you can be, be tricked into selecting just early born singles. Um, as can I, if I go in there without any information. Pedigree is is unbelievably important for breeding values, and that's really the I guess the the key underpinning part of the technology is that it's not just saying, well, this this animal was the fastest growing animal in the group. It's saying, well, back in its pedigree, its sire or its dam or its grandsire or granddam, all of that information about how they compared with their contemporary groups comes into that same bit of information. So, and obviously heart siblings and stuff in the same in the same drop and if you multiply that out with the linkage that happens in the industry these days there's there's progeny all over the place that have been that have been linked and compared and it just becomes really really powerful that pedigree of understanding and that all comes into this this single number that we get to look at on a, on an individual trait on that day the great thing about not having to understand heritability is that it's in the trait um, it's already taken into account in a breeding value so that number you see is what you expect to get passed onto the progeny has already been sort of diluted by the by the heritability of the trait. And to improve the accuracy a bit, the cor anything that's correlated with it will be taken into account. So there's a whole heap of um, smart bit of science that goes on to to generate an ASBV, and they're never they're never perfect, and we and they're not a silver bullet, but but used well, we can we know that uh, on average, if you're buying a, a few rams, on average that team will Will breed to the to what what the average of that breeding value uh, said that they said that they should, which is 
which is an amazing tool that we get to play with. Um, just really quickly for those that sort of were, were down the, the lower end of understanding breeding bees, um, they're all they're all based when the database started, and and um, so they're all based on zero. So and zero was set when the database started, and then they just deviate from there. And so that's always so that zero place is generally set in stone and um, changes every or very rarely. But um, and I guess the other thing to understand is that negative breeding values aren't always bad. You want a breeding value to go in the direction that you would like to take the trait. So for something like DAG, where you want less of it, um, a negative breeding value is good. Same with worms. Um, same with fibre diamond if you want to get finer. Um, so they deviate from zero and sometimes negative is bad and sometimes it's good, but it, generally you want to take the trait in the way that you want to take the breeding value in the way you want to take the trait. Um, so that's all I was going to cover on on ASPVs um, and we'll get back to some more specific ASPVs towards the end of this talk. Um, the other thing that I mentioned about genetic game was selection intensity, and I'll just go through this really quickly. But obviously, the only thing that you get to control in selection intensity as a commercial farmer is is reproduction. The more lambs you've got on the ground, the the more the bigger the drop you're selecting for, and therefore the less of the ones you have to keep. So with genetics, quite most traits are under lots and lots of genes, uh, under the control of lots of genes, and you don't really know which genes you're selecting. You're just trying to um, pick the individuals which which possess the set of genes that you want and generally the less you get the less animals you have to take from a population the better you'll go the more genetic gain you make so if we start with a normal population and you have to take the majority of that population because you've got low reproduction or this is in your use selection you might be bringing forward sort of 70 percent of the group um, and so you make a little bit of genetic gain from that selection in, and that's that's what happens in our ewe flocks um, we don't make a lot of gain there because we're bringing a lot of them forward, we're not actually culling that many. Um, opposite to that, if you're really ramped up your reproduction or what you see in a ram breeding flock where you might only be putting 30% of the rams, ram drop that were born might be going up for sale or being considered for, for selection. Um, the higher that intensity is, the less animals you have to select, the bigger the gain you expect to make, the bigger you're gonna shift that that population. But the way that you get to control this this lever is is, the snowball effect of reproduction that I talk about, which is um, the more lambs you've got, the bigger the drop is, the less uh, selection or less females you need to come into that next that next group. So you can be uh, harder and harder on those animals that make the cut and put a lot of pressure on them, which sort of, which generally makes them better. And, they've, and then that snowballs because um, you start seeing, you're getting better use with more reproduction, which gives you more selection pressure and that snowball goes forward. You need a combination of genetics and and management to get that to get that happening. Um, the other one I'll cover quickly is generation interval. And really, this the only way you get to play this game is um, is keep your ewe flock young. And there'll be economic reasons why that is a good idea, and economic reasons why that's not a good idea, depending on your your breed and and your um, sale ewe price. At the moment, with restock of ewes worth a lot of money. I'd say there's good money in um, turning over ewes uh, at younger younger age groups, which keeps your keeps your average age uh, of your ewe down, which which drops your generation interval and makes you go faster in terms of genetic gain if you're making other good decisions. Um, but the generation interval just is simply the average age of the rams and the ewes when their lambs are born. Um, it tends to be on most of your flocks to be around 3.1, 3.2 years, depending on how you structure that. You can drop that by obviously selling out age groups of older ewes earlier or or mating new lambs, the two ways that you get to, to control that. Generally, that wouldn't be a um, something you would, you'd be doing that for other reasons other than genetic gain, but a lot of studs where, particularly if you're introducing a new trait, you'll be um, often using ram lambs or, or mating new lambs to make things go faster, get the wheel going faster, um, and and you can do that commercially. You can do that as well, but again, you need you need to make sure um, you make sure your other selection decisions are being made well. To otherwise, you can go fast, but if you're going fast and just spinning your wheels, it, it doesn't take you anywhere. Um, I've got a calculator that does that, but we'll we'll go through that. Um, 
I guess the important thing for us is is not about what I think the type of sheep you should be running. It's about what what you think the type of sheep should be running. And ASPVs don't answer that question for you because you need to work out um, which ASPVs you're going to look at and in some cases, which indexes you're going to be looking at. And and to do that, you need to really, you can't be listening to me and you can't be listening to anybody about about what you want to do because that tends to be um, partly driven by your environment and, and where you live and what and sort of the, the restricting factors that are, that are part of that. And that might be um, a heap of barber's pole worm. So worm resistance is really important or it might be um, quite a few of you, I think, are in sort of subtropics where where wool whiteness is really important because if you have any squint then then you'll get a lot of um, fleece issues and fleece rot and therefore body strike so um, it is unique to you um, and you can live next door to somebody on pretty much the same conditions but you'll have your own kind of biases that are being put there by your, by previous generations or by some way you used to work or whatever um, and that's fine like we all need to enjoy what we do we all need to enjoy the sheep type that we're running and and generally you do it do it better if it's something you really enjoy and you enjoy your your product so it is a really personal thing to work out which traits that you should focus on but it's something you need to do and i guess the way we think about it is is think firstly about what exactly you produce and not just i produce meat or wool when we asked you at the start um but it's i produce a 19 micron wool that goes to icebreaker or I produce um, a supermarket lamb, a super, supermarket carcass that, that goes to the domestic trade in Australia or I'm, I'm aiming for a heavyweight carcass that goes that gets exported or I'm, I'm running weathers and I'm turning off um, a few to export um, to, to go live shipping or whatever it happens to be. But I think actually having a little bit of a think about who is that consumer? Who is Who am I actually producing this stuff for? And what is it that's important to them is something that I think is something I'm, I'm not sure we all think about uh, every day um, and you don't need to every day. But when you're sitting down doing a breeding objective, you want to get really clear about and because it just helps you think about, well, is that a market that's still there? If I'm producing suiting for um, a wool for the suiting market um, for an Italian spinner that we've seen that reduce over time. Um, and I'm not saying you don't do that, but you have to have eyes wide open that that's not as that's not a the juggernaut that the next to skin market in Merino is at the moment. Or you might be really focused on a particular, yeah, particular carcass to, to get a, to, to meet a, a market that you know that's pretty consistent. So the way I think about um, setting your breeding objective is, is to go about it across four different, um, four different um, methods or, or assess, assess the uh, your breeding objective across four different levels and one is the first one is those that make you money so think about and normally you want normally in a, in a commercial scenario you want to have about four or five traits that you're looking at and so i would normally give you one to select that you that's a make you money trait um often when we think about genetics we think immediately that we're just gonna like if i ask you what's your what do you want to improve you'll be like fleece weight um or or lamb growth or weaning weight or and, and a lot of those things that, that come straight to our mind in genetics are the make your money traits how do i make more from from this animal um i guess my last sort of yeah my theories are around that's that's good but there's just as much power and save your money and save your time in genetics as there is in in make your money so traits that make your money and we're going to go through some examples of these um traits that save your money i think that's really important um because obviously profitability is pretty easy to work out. It's how much money you make versus how much money you spend. And and different genotypes, different animals will, will cost you more to run. Um, time is the third one. And I've never met a farmer that tells me they, they've got too much time in their hands and they really wish they could dag a few more sheep. Um, everyone is time poor. Um, there's always more jobs to be done than there is uh, physical potential to, to actually achieve those jobs um, and so some sheep take you more time and some sheep take you less and we'll cover some traits around that as well and then back to where I started which was those that delight a customer so I think I'm quite purposeful about that the words I've chosen there delight so what what are the traits that I would bolt into my animal that really would delight a customer and that 
doesn't have to be, you might not be getting paid for that, but it's worth actually thinking about what are my, what are the traits that I think my customers are, are demanding. So um, I'll go through each of those in a little bit more detail just to give you some examples. And um, But yeah, I think one thing you want to do in your business is sit down with anyone that's, that's part of that decision-making process, whether it's the whole family or staff, or, or if it might be just one of you that's, that's got all the, makes all the calls, um, whoever's important in that decision, get them around the table or, or around the, um, and have this yarn about what is it that we really want to improve in these sheep. Um, and I encourage you to keep it to sort of four or five things. Um, don't get too carried away unless you're a ram breeder. If you're a ram breeder, I'll give you quite a few more than that and expect a few more than that. Um, and I guess that this is not about what do I want to improve across the business. Like we all want to have other, like we might want to get more lambs, but we might be doing that through tailored nutrition or, or getting our mob sizes down. It's thinking about what do we want to improve most with our genetic program. Um, so just quickly going through the sort of traits that that I would sort of incorporate into breeding programs, so things that make you money. I think growth is is an unbelievably important trait for every sheep breeding enterprise. Um, growth gives you options. Lambs that grow fast are either going to make you money or they're desired by someone else to make some money. Animals that grow slow just, just get you in a corner. You can't make money out of them and nobody else wants them. Um, I won't go through too much about the individual breeding values, but they're the abbreviations you'll see. Um, if you're in the meat game, you want to be focused on weaning weights and maybe post weaning weights. Um, if you're in the, the wool game, you might be more focused on post weaning and yearling weights. Um, what I would say is you want to be going for the earliest growth breeding value that makes sense for you. Um, because one of the one of the traps of going for high high growth uh, is that you'll end up with big ewes. But the earlier you select, so the earlier breeding value you use to select for is um, the less that the less correlated they are with adult weight. So um, yeah, we haven't got time today to go through all the details, but but growth is a really a great make your money trait and it's also a great risk management tool. Reproduction is is often on everyone's list of something that they want to improve. They want to improve either conception, um, litter size or the or the lamb survival. We've had a number of lambs weaned breeding value for a num uh, for many years. Um, we've got new breeding values now which separate that out into conception, litter size and a new rearing ability. Again I won't go into a heap of detail there but Number of lambs weaned would be a, a breeding value that you should be able to find on on rams if if people are. It's been the least the least recorded trait. Um, it is something really important to have um, have a discussion with your with your ram breeder to try and get information on that. Um, I could ask for hands up, but I won't be able to see how many hands go up. But a lot of people, well, I hear a few people who buy twin born rams with their aim of of getting um, increasing their ewe selection. Uh, sorry, increasing ewe reproduction. Um, and that does slightly increase over time. And so you, that does have a positive influence. Um, what this graph here shows is that, um, and it's pretty hard to explain without a, without a pointer, but um, the this is a flock of ewes. It's actually a WA uh, flock of ewes that have breeding values on number of lambs weaned. And that's on the, on the horizontal axis is their actual phenotypic reproductive performance, their average, how many lambs they weaned over over their their lifetime or the percentage of, of lambs they weaned. Um, and that big wide spread is is showing you, if you were just buying twin born rams, so if you're out there at the 200%, um, or sorry, if you're buying one ram, which, um, which was twin born, it might be a genetically highly reproductive ram or have daughters that are highly reproductive, or it might be down at minus five for NLW and therefore a really poor one. So that twin, being born twin, doesn't necessarily guarantee you anything, because 95% of that fact is is due to things other than genes. Whereas the breeding value, the number of lambs weaned breeding value we've seen is quite rep repetitive or repeatable, um, and can actually bring reproduction into your into the daughters in your flock, and and actually start to increase the number of lambs you're turning off. So, and that's this is the biggest example of where breeding values are really important. When you've got lowly heritable traits like reproduction, breeding values are gold in, in getting rid of some of the some of the error. Um, 
I'm not going to go through heaps of traits, but the things that save you money, things that I think about is one is condition score. Um, well, you will, many of you will have done things like a lifetime you management, um, and you've seen the the benefits of condition score. Um, obviously, the way you get condition score on ewes is is through either decreasing stocking rate or increasing feeding, um, or managing that better. Um, a couple of traits that will give you that for free are the fat breeding value. Um, higher fat breeding value of the size. This is those yellow dots there are, are groups of ewes from progeny tests we've done here in New Zealand. So every dot is a group of progeny from a single sire across a number of years. And that's the ewe, the condition score of those ewes from that sire at their first mating. And so you'll see there there's sort of over a condition score difference in in just genetic those animals have been running in the same paddock since conception. So an enormous change in their ability to main or to have condition score um, based on their sire breeding values for fat and I could transpose the same thing for muscle. So muscle and fat uh, are giving you condition score kind of um, it's not for free obviously they've got to eat it eat feed to put it on but under the same management conditions you've got sheep which will be in higher condition score so I think that's a really great trait to save you money because you're either using um, less feed to get them up to condition score or you're running more animals and and uh, and it becomes a making money trade. But um, I don't know how much foot rot's running around, um, but there's been quite wet for a number of months over there in Oz, so there'd be a bit I'm imagining. Um, we've worked over here for the last eight years to develop a breeding value for foot rot. It's now available as an ASBV. Sorry, as a breeding value will soon be an ASBV, but it's available to. Um, we've got some trial work going on in Australia. It's definitely available for New Zealand merino breeders um, and will be for Australians um, but massively um, massive massive potential to breed out foot rot by using the breeding value and it's really exciting what's happening over here in terms of that and I won't go into that too much but it's another trait that that costs you a lot of labor um, and so breeding it out saves you a hell of a lot of time obviously but also a lot of a lot of labor and a lot of cost um, so traits that might that save your time, fly strikes probably fairly um, something like hot topic at the moment with a lot of summer rainfall, um, and we've seen from the work that AWI funded for years um, that fly strike itself is 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 heritable, um, and obviously breech strike being the the primary one, but but body strike as well, um, and the traits that are that are correlated with that are a breech wrinkle, dag breech cover, so that bare area, um, urine stain and fleece rot and they're all got breeding values that you can, that if your ram breeder is scoring those things you can get get breeding values and so you'll see amazing power of going for low, like for something like DAG, we've got rams here who under the same conditions all their progeny don't have a single DAG on them and other rams that will be like DAG down to the toes. Um, yeah, so lots of opportunity to take time and cost out of our business by getting the right, by selecting the right animals. Um, and I think most people would get rid of DAGs and we just see this massive variation and we see it being very repeatable. We've got a guy here that loves giving us uh, information um, and he'll he'll score them as, as lambs and then score them again as, as tutus. And the sire groups will just line up exactly the same way every time and the individuals will line up pretty similar as well. If they're daggy once, they'll be daggy for a while or they'll be daggy every time. Um, and then things that delight a customer, um, IMF's obviously right on the, um, is one thing that we've all, we've heard a lot about or marbling. Um, obviously it used to be something we talked a lot about in beef and, and we're all familiar with Wagyu type story, but um, obviously we've got some really innovative breeders that are pushing um, IMF in, in sheep as well um, and obviously we know that the thing that we loved it when we love to bite into one of those chops is is that that mouthfeel from that fat um, which is makes it juicy and, and gives it a lot of a lot of taste a lot of texture um, so we can breed that into sheep so that's that's one thing that that we can use to do a lot of customer I guess one of the old ones is, is just fiber diamond meeting that customer needs if you decide you want to produce for the next to skin market at 19 micron then you can use the breeding value to to not select too strong or not too fine to to make sure you're roughly in in that breeding value in that category for micron that you want to be. Um, again, much more valuable to use the breeding value than than the actual raw data for that, which is something that takes a bit of getting your head around. Um, don't really want to get into a 
into an amusing debate, but but Breach Wrinkle, we've shown that, or well, lots of people have shown that we've got customers now going for for non-mules wool, and and part of the process of getting to non-mules is obviously reducing your breach wrinkle, uh, another way to sort of focus on those those consumer type traits. Again, hugely heritable, um, huge variation to work with. You don't have to get rid of fleece weight. There's a lot of things that a lot of positives come from removing breach wrinkle. Um, so getting towards the end and conscious of time, um, I guess in my head. Uh, the, the rams, our, our job is to select rams, but we're selecting bags of jeans. Um, they really are just a mobile delivery system for jeans. Um, and so we have to think of them that way. It doesn't matter how shiny they are. Um, if they're structurally good and the data is good, um, we need to, we need, and they've been, ideally they've been run under the, the same management conditions or their, their mums have that you're expecting your use to run under. Um, yeah, using the data plus plus what you see in terms of the wool, or if you're looking at carcass, um, uh, yeah, they are just bags of genes, and, and really important that you understand that that you're trying to get you're trying to remove the error in that in that ram selection decision. So you're trying to use some data to help you do that. ASPVs are, are really powerful, and um, yeah, and just really take out a lot of the guesswork. They don't take out all of it. You've still got You've still got a job to look at the wool if that's what you're looking at. You've still got a job to look at the feet. You've still got a job to make sure they're functional. Um, but ASPVs help you focus down on the, on the traits that you want to you want to uh, to focus on. And it'll be different. You can get 30 people in a room with 150 rams, and all, most of them will select different rams um, because you've got different things that are important to you. But I guess yeah, in my head, if you can measure it, why would you guess? And that's that across everything we do with sheep, trying to get good information is is really important. I'll I'll call it off there and um and see if there's any any questions. But happy to take any questions. Um, if you haven't listened to Head Shepherd, jump on. It's on Apple and Spotify and wherever you find your podcasts. Um, or yeah, happy to happy to get an email and with any questions. But yeah, see what see what you got out there now, Kate. Perfect. Thanks for that, Mark. That was really good. Um, I yeah found that really interesting, especially like some of the comments around yeah even the twin born versus single born and what you know all the different things that goes into that as a it's not just what you know what the eye the, at that you know there's more going into that so yeah I found that really good we've had um, a couple of questions so one question and I I'm interested to know too and it's at the point of you know how many traits should I be focusing on um, and select for to be so, um, successful in lifting um, those in my flock and at what point does you know, having too many, selecting too many traits, does it become like disadvantaged, I guess, or, or yeah. Yeah, really good question. And I think um, we sort of came up with a magic number of four, but not many people stick to that number. Um, I think obviously the more traits you put in there, uh, the better you've got to go at, um, yeah, the, the more work you need to do to make gain on all those traits. So it's not saying you can't, like there's a, a Lots of ram breeders across Australia, and I'm mean, the one that I've worked with and still do a lot is Merino Tech WA. They've got 10 things in their breeding objective and make pretty much right on theoretical genetic gain across all 10 things, but they do a lot of work to achieve that. If you're going in and you're just buying rams once a year and you're not um, hunting every every possible option, then four or five traits is, is enough to focus on. I think the important thing there is that you're doing you're doing complementary things both in that ram buying and what you're doing at home. So if you're if your four traits are well, you know, if you've got a trait, say it's growth, and you're um, and you're buying or you're just selecting the highest growth lamb, ewe lambs to bring into your flock every year, um, that's your selection strategy within your ewe replacements. Um, if you then go to the ram sale and don't actually look at, don't actually use a breeding value to do that, and you're just looking at, I'll buy the big ones. Um, then, or I'll look at the wool on that day, and I won't actually look at how big they are at all. Then, um, obviously, you're not, you haven't got those two things in sync. I think to make, to make gain in traits, you want to make sure whatever you're doing at home is is in sync with what you're doing with within your ram selection, and really being deliberate about that. So, I mean, there's no, there's no definitive number. The more you put in there, the more work you've got to do to achieve it. You can achieve it, but but four or five generally for commercial people is enough um, with a few, because you've got to look at 
that's four or five measured traits. Then you're going to have to look at feet and you have to look at leg structure and you have to look at wool if you're, if you're in a merino. Um, there's a whole heap of other things that then remove the number of rams you've got to left. So the more than that, and you end up with very few animals to look at, which gets a bit disappointing as well. Yeah, no, that, yeah, I agree. And I suppose one another thing is, that, you know, when you if you're trying to achieve one particular um, genetic trait, like you know frame size, and then you're looking at growth, like it's where does one complement the other, I suppose. But um, we've had another one come in, and he said, "What will start? Um, what will start measure? What will a stud measure to get?" Or they said, "Yeah, to get a foot rot breeding value." So, what is it? What's incorporated in measuring for getting foot rot breeding value? Uh, so this sounds like lunacy, but we we give the rams foot rot basically. So over here, and we've got a few studs in Australia that have started to do it. Um, it's taking them somewhere where, like on a farm where you know there's foot rot, uh, letting it to develop a little bit, sort of three or four weeks longer than you normal. Well, not even that long, but um, you let the foot rot develop and make sure it's under running foot rot in at least 10% of um, of the flock. And then we turn them all over, score every individual foot on, so zero being perfect, five being completely blown foot rot. Um, and then that data goes into the, into sheep genetics in Australia and gets converted into a breeding value. So it's actually same with the best way to select for any trait is to actually let it develop in the animal. Um, and so we've had our progeny test since I started it in 2013, we've run whatever up to our eighth drop now. Um, all of those progeny go through a foot rot challenge and then and then get scored and then slaughtered. But in a stud sense, it's um, often it's the cull, like you might, if there's 30, 40% of cull ram lambs, um, that have sort of been kicked out for wool quality or whatever else, but that, but they actually, um, and then they can go and get a foot rot challenge, get get scored, and then go and and go and to, to get processed. Um, so yeah, so it's it's actually physically giving them foot rot. Yeah, right. That yeah, it sounds good. Um, it's something really. that foot no no interesting interesting, but relevant. Like it's relevant and it's a trait a trait that you know we can objectively, you know, manage so many different things in our flock. So that's a benefit, major benefit to the industry. Um, it's been, another question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, what are you going to say? Sorry. I mean, it's been massive. We've found size now that, like Marina size, that you can stand their progeny in foot rot and they just don't get it. Um, yeah. yeah like it, it is it's absolutely mind-blowing how, power, how powerful genes are to... Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And if that doesn't showcase it at the very least, and what does, like it just yeah, showcases yeah, yeah. the ability. Yeah. Um, and one other question here is, and it's probably more a bit of a management, but genetics and like mating new lambs. And like, I know you've, you've got some work around that space and, <clears throat> and you mentioned it earlier, it's a good way to quickly progress, um, you know, gen genetic, genetic success in your flock. What some things that that growers should be considering if they're looking at that, you know, really looking at that space. Um, so genetically, it's it's post weaning weight. Um, the higher that is, the more success you'll have, and that kind of just gives you more growth, basically. So you get them up to a mating weight earlier. Um, positive fat is uh, shown to be useful as well, and uh, low wrinkle of three. So. If, in terms of your genetics, getting those three things um, right are important, um, and you probably want to yeah, you want to be at least moving in the right direction in those three before you sort of start, um, or you want to be doing a pretty good job of your maiden of your normal maiden use before you actually start mating new lambs anyway. But they're the three traits that that you should be really considering if if mating new lambs is is high on your agenda. Um, that's true across. Obviously, that growth one is, is true across um, any any breed. Um, Management-wise, it's really it's a weight game. Um, you'll get more success. Well, the heavier they are, the more success you'll have. Positive weight gain while they're being mated more important in in ewe lambs than any other any other age group. Um, and so, the more weight they're putting on while the rams are in, generally, the better the re result will be. Um, and there's something else that I was just going to mention that's just finished, but um, uh, weight gain, oh, and age. So generally pretty hard 
at seven months, which is your perfect because then that's on a they're landing on a twelve month cycle. A little bit harder at seven months tends to be a lot easier at eight months, and then wean those their lambs early um, and and move them on that way. So yeah, you can sort of most people do this delay their mating their ewe lambs for a three to four weeks after their normal their adult ewe mating, um, and that just gives them that a little bit more time for for the switch to turn on. Um, teasing is really important, so 14 days with teaser pre ram introduction is really important in new lambs to get that silent estrus out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I suppose one of the things, obviously, is this is where nutrition really showcases its ability to complement genetics is in this space. Like, nutrition is a major factor with your ewe lambs, isn't it? So, nutrition as yeah, an environment, yeah. yeah. Wow. It's a yeah, it's a big weight game, and you've got to, and you kind of that day starts at like pre lambing really. Like if you're going to do it, you kind of well, this, it is a bit season dependent too. If you have a great season, then obviously your you go out there, you weigh your weaners, and they're and they're heavier than average. You're like right, oh, this is the year we can we might be able to mate our ewe lambs. Um, yeah. But yeah, big big yeah big weight factors, and you kind of have to be on the you don't have many weeks to drop the ball after weaning. To not to not meet your targets, you yeah. kind of have to be be onto it and and regular weighing. Like there's, I mean, I just oh, obviously I'm a I'm a scientist. I love numbers, but um, the people that really nail this are the ones that are weighing them monthly and adjusting and keep. Um, you don't have to weigh them all, but weigh a sample to make sure they are putting on the weight you think they are and and adjust things if they're not because yeah you don't really ha you don't really have many weeks to not not have them on on the right trajectory to hit that sort of yeah. 40 45 kilos when the ram goes yeah. in and understanding your standard reference weight too would you say mark like having a good grip on your standard reference weight and you know managing by condition score and stuff like that would you say um yep understanding what sort of weight you need to head towards um to meet um to be at your know, sort of proportion of of that weight but in ewe lambs, I yeah, tend really just focused on weight rather. I like don't use it all condition score, but in ewe lambs, it's generally a, I just keep weighing them and, and use that growth as as your measure of success. Because if you get yeah. them, you get them heavy, then yeah, hit it, hit the ram heavy and growing still. Then you've sort of done all that you can, and then um, yeah, and it's not yeah, I don't think any. Well, a few people are getting it pretty consistent, but you can. There'll be the odd year that floors you and you don't know why it didn't work but um yeah. well we've had another question on that nutrition space come in which is i'd be interested to hear what you have to say is what's the correlation between fat and feed intake um that's an interesting question because there's two different answers depending on who you ask but um uh generally as a like as a sheep fattens they there's hormone things that start reducing their feed intake um if we look at look at the like selection lines generally high more efficient animals or so the lowly efficient animals the ones that eat a lot and and gain less uh, are the fatter ones like fat's expensive to lay down so they generally early in the season you would say they eat more but then later in the season they eat less so that's um in some experiments, it's been shown that the high fat breeding value animals are actually more efficient. Um, in other experiments, it's been shown that they're less efficient. So, really, uh, not a very clear answer. Um, yeah. I think I think what there's a big study going on at the moment that AWI are, um, are funding that um, Murdoch University are, are, are running over in Perth, which are really trying to hone in on this whole area, and and they're sort of in the midst of a lot of um, analysis at the moment to try and answer that um, and yeah so I'm kind of waiting uh, yeah, impatiently waiting to see exactly what where we get to on, on that stuff but it's not it's not very clear cut there's there's different side groups doing different things and um, yeah there's a lot of lot of lot of interest and a lot of um, yeah a lot of a lot of things to learn what we do see happen um, in a, like across where people breed for higher fat animals, we see that they can they basically start increasing stocking rate because they'll maintain condition at um, at heavier stocking weights, and that's how people make the money out of it generally. Yeah, 
Right. Well, yeah, thanks for that, Mark. We, that's about, I think that's all exhausted our questions. Um, if anyone has any questions post the webinar, feel free to contact um, either myself and I can pass them on to Mark or I can share Mark's, um, if he was, if he's happy yet, share all, I think he put it on his screen before, but share his contact details. So um, thanks, Mark. Really appreciate having you come along. It's been really interesting and it's a space that just continues to grow and get more, more interest in, and become more prevalent in the sheep industry. So thank you for that. Um, no worries. Thanks, Kate. That's all good. I, as a part of this, I just have to do the due diligence and thank um, Tim Clark and Sue Street, who are colleagues of mine in local land services that helped this come along. And um, just to note that this project was supported by Central West Local Land Services from the Australian Government's National Air Care Program. So thanks everyone for coming along today. We hope you got something out of it. Um, and like, if you could, please fill out the survey after this, that would be much appreciated. So thank you.